Today I'm gonna to be reading John, John eight verses seven through eleven. John eight verses seven through eleven. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood stood up again and said, "All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone." Then, then he stooped down and wrote in the dust again, and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this. They slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn, condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. That was John 8, verses 7 through 11. John 8, verses 7 through 11. Can you still see my screen? No. Now I can. Yeah, now I can. Okay. You can? All right, not anymore. It went away. Hang on. Now it's back. All right. Technical difficulty. Sorry about that. The next song is going to be Victory in Jesus before we hear from Brother Derek. Let's begin. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing. His cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and hear my broken spirit. I then obeyed his blessed commands and gained the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me 
to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I'd like to say good morning to everyone. I pray that we've all had a blessed week. Again, we want to be in prayer for all of those families uh, that are grieving at this time. Uh, we lift you up in our prayers uh, and uh, just know that we as a church family are here to do whatever we can to support you during uh, this time. I'd like to turn your attention to the eighth chapter of the book of John as we get back into the book of John. Um, I want to uh, read verses two through verse 11. I want to uh, thank uh, Brother Zaire for the reading of our scripture on this morning. John chapter eight, beginning at verse number two, the Bible says, and early in the morning, Jesus came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him and he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman caught are taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that she should be stoned. But what sayest you? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast first a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground and and they which heard it, being convicted in their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even until the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are your accusers? Have no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. No doubt each of us is somewhat familiar with this story of the woman caught in adultery. We have read it many times and had our anger stirred as we watched the self righteous religious leaders degrading these women, degrading this woman rather, not for the sake of punishing her, but for the sake of finding something they could use against Jesus. Would he side with the law of Moses and condemn the woman? Or would he side with the woman and contradict the law of Moses? If he were to say, let the woman go, he would be showing a disregard for the law by sanctioning her evil, almost encouraging it. He would be showing uh, 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 a disregard in, in the fact that he let her go. But if he were to say, stone her, he would be giving the Pharisees something to accuse him of before the Roman government for they were the only ones in that day that could legally condemn a person to death. But he would also be throwing his reputation of being a friend to sinners to the wind, thus losing his position of high regard with the people. How would Jesus answer these heartless hypocrites? It seems like a tough situation, but we have read with pride about the way Jesus handles it. These men thought they had Jesus. They didn't think he could get out of this one. 
They thought they had finally trapped him. But Jesus is not confused or unsure of how to handle this situation. They had not left him speechless and unable to bring back an answer to them. For as we have read many times, and we've had to smile as he quietly bends down and begins to write in the sand, almost as if he isn't listening to these accusers, and it's fun to see Jesus forcing them to keep pressing for an answer from him. And Jesus is able to very calmly show the wisdom that only comes from God. We've been moved with compassion for this woman who was being humiliated in front of the scores of jeering and leering people who were listening to Jesus that day. Who knows how she was clothed? Who knows how untidy she looked? Who knows what all the Pharisees had put her through before she was pushed into the temple? Maybe they had paraded her through the city, yelling out uh, their accusations for all to hear along the way. Maybe they had sped upon her or hit her. Who knows what they had done to this woman already before they took her to Jesus? But whatever condition and whatever she had already gone through that morning, she was completely disgraced and exposed in front of all these people and this great teacher, Jesus, to see. And even though she was caught in the act, we have to feel sorry for how uh, uh, for her for being dragged into a situation like this and for being used as a pawn in the Pharisee scheme to nail Jesus. My question to us today is, why do we look at this woman with such compassion? Why do we feel sorry for her? I mean, she committed an awful uh, sin. She was an adulteress. She was the type of woman that ruined marriages. She was the type of woman who leaves innocent children injured. She was a home wrecker. Why do we tend to side with her? It is simply because we hold the Pharisees in such disdain. It is simply because she was being used so cruelly by her accusers for the sake of getting at Jesus. Why is it? I tend to believe that while we probably do despise the Pharisees' actions and attitudes, while we are disgusted at them for using this woman as bait, while we are angered by their hate and cruelty, maybe the reason that we feel the way we do is more than that. Maybe it's because we can relate to this woman. Maybe it's because we share some commonalities with this woman. No, we may not have been caught in the act of adultery, but we understand what she's going through. Well, what do I mean by this? Let me explain. Three things I want to share with you today. The first thing that I want to share in this commonality that we might have with this woman is our guilt is undeniable. I think that first of all, we can relate to this woman because her guilt was undeniable. In our story today, we find Jesus He's teaching in the temple when all of a sudden in rushes this posse of scribes and Pharisees dragging along a woman that was probably only half dressed. They threw her at the feet of Jesus and in a tone that was dripping with hatred and malice, they said, Master, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, in the very act of adultery. Now, at this point, we could go down a lot of side. We could ask questions like, where's the man? I mean, after all, as I heard one preacher say about this, it takes two to tango. Obviously, in the act of adultery, there is more than one person involved. So where's the man? We could also ask how they caught this woman in the act of adultery. Adultery is generally something that is not necessarily done openly for everyone to witness. It's something that is usually committed in privately. 
Does these spies, uh, do they reside outside a brothel and then they send in uh, rushing uh, when a man enters? Did they set up this woman by having a man seduce her? How did they catch her red hand? All sorts of these questions could be asked. And those facts may be interesting to study, but they are not the point of this lesson. In fact, they are not even the point of the story. The point is that the woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Whoever she was, doesn't matter. However, the Pharisees caught her. However, they caught her, doesn't even matter. What matters is the fact that she was guilty. And we don't read of her trying to argue the fact that she was guilty. We don't even hear her making excuses. There was no need for her to try to explain away uh, what the Pharisees thought they saw. There was no pointing at someone else and saying that it was their fault. She was caught red-handed. The law says thou shalt not commit adultery. And she had broken the law. She was guilty and her guilt was undeniable. And today the truth is whether we like it or not and whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want to own up to the fact or not, we are undeniably as people of God guilty as we are. Scriptures tell us in Romans 3 and 10 that there is none righteous, no, not one. Later on in the same chapter, Paul says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46 says that there is no one who does not sin. There was not one person listening to me today that is innocent in this, in, in this chat room that we're in today. There is not one person who can claim that they have led a sin-free life. We have no grounds on which to argue against the fact that we are sinners. We have no grounds for arguing against the fact that we have broken the law of God. We can try and argue if we want, and many have done that. But First John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth of the matter is, no matter how much we try to, to, to deny it, we are guilty. The law has commanded us not to sin, and we have committed sin. It has commanded us not to lie, and we have lied. It commanded us to honor our parents, and we have done just the opposite. It has commanded us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we have not. It has commanded us to love our neighbors like ourselves, and we have not. We have broken the law. We have been proven guilty, and we, like the woman in John 8, have been caught red-handed, and our guilt is undeniable. And while our guilt is undeniable, the law, point number two, is unmerciful. The second way that I think that we can relate to this woman is because not only was her guilt and ours undeniable, but we, like she did, found that the law is unmerciful. The Pharisees, they throw this woman at the feet of Jesus and say, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery and the law of Moses says to stone her. And they were right. The Old Testament law had a very harsh penalty for adultery. It was one of those crimes that was awarded by death. It was a capital offense that rank right up there with murder and witchcraft. Deuteronomy 22 tells us that a married woman or a woman engaged to be married who was found to have committed adultery was taken and stoned. If a man was found guilty of committing adultery with a woman, both were to be taken outside the city and stoned. The penalty for adultery was harsh. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were demanding. They were demanding justice. This woman had broken the law. She had been caught in the very act of adultery and proven guilty. Therefore, she deserved to be stoned to death. And you know, something we hear a lot about these days is how much we deserve to live just the way we want to live. 
We deserve to live financially, a financially secure life. We deserve to have a nice home. We deserve to have a nice car. We deserve to have a perfect family. We deserve to be treated fairly at work. If we are mistreated, we deserve to be aptly uh, uh, compensated for our heartache. Everyone is into this idea that we should be demanding our rights. I want my rights. We better be treated fairly or someone's going to be in trouble. We deserve to get what we've got coming to us. But let me tell you something today. If we got what we deserve, truly, we'd all be in trouble. If we got what was coming to us, I don't think we'd really like it all that much. And I'll tell you what, there is no way in the world that I want to stand in the judgment bar of God covered with the sin and the disgrace of sin and the shame of sin and demand to God's face that I want to be treated fair. There's no way I want to stand there covered in my guilt and demand my rights. There's no way I want to stand in front of God and demand to get what I've got coming to me. I don't really want what I deserve. I don't want what I've got coming to me. I feel, I, I kind of feel uh, like what the song wrote, writer said a long time ago. If we don't get what we deserve, it's a really good thing because the fact that my guilt is undeniable, the fact that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God means that the only thing I am deserving of is the penalty for my own sin. And the penalty for sin is harsh. The penalty for sin is stiff. The law is unmerciful. Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death or the reward for sin is death. If we got what we deserve, brothers and sisters, we would receive death. If we were to get the wages that our sins earned, we would be rewarded by an eternity separated from God. If we got what we had coming to us, we would surely be cursed forever immediately because our sin deserves swift justice and justice calls for the immeasurable and eternal punishment for our sins. The law demands our heads. It is unmerciful. Our, our guilt is undeniable today. The law is unmerciful, but the grace of God is unsearchable. Let me hurry on with this lesson today. I, I want to tell you that while our guilt is undeniable and the law is unmerciful, God's grace is unsearchable. While there is no doubt that you and I have broken the law, we are guilty. And while we definitely deserve to have uh, to pay the penalty for our sin, this story in John 8 teaches us that our God is a God who is willing to extend his grace and his mercy, his unmerited favor and forgiveness to our guilty and condemned soul. In our story today, we find a beautiful picture of God's grace and mercy. Here, these Pharisees were proving this woman guilty of adultery. They were demanding the stiffest penalty of the law. And the only person who is truly qualified to point the finger refuses to do so. The only person who truly has the power to condemn her doesn't. The only one who really has the authority to judge, chooses to pardon. Notice, Jesus never condoned this woman's sin. He never made it as though she hadn't done anything wrong. He never, or he didn't say to this woman, I know that you were falsely accused. He doesn't say, hey, don't worry about it. He doesn't brush off her guilt. 
He doesn't hold her unaccountable. He just simply says these words. He who is without sin cast the first stone. And when he looked up, no one remained except him and this woman. One author once said, two things were left alone, misery and mercy. Her guilt and condemnation were overwhelming, and yet we see the beautiful grace of God in action. In a situation, brothers and sisters, where there was no doubt that this woman was guilty, in a situation where the law certainly demanded this woman be stoned for her crimes, Jesus gave her grace and forgiveness. He looked up and he said, woman, where are your accusers? No man has condemned you. And she said, no one has, Lord. And Jesus says these beautiful words. He says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. He offers her a second chance. He didn't condone her sins. I want you to see that today. He forgave her sin. He didn't give her a license to sin. In fact, he told her to stop sinning. But he offered her a fresh slate and a new start. See, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Jesus put his amazing grace on display. And today, God's grace is a grace that we cannot fathom. It's a grace that we cannot comprehend. It's a grace that goes beyond anything that we could ever imagine. You and I have been proven guilty. All have sinned. You and I deserve to spend eternity in the fire and in the darkness and torture of hell fire. But there is one. Only one who has the power to condemn, who is willing right now to extend his hand of grace to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The only one who has the authority to judge would rather offer his unmerited favor and forgiveness for our sins. His is an unsearchable grace. It's an amazing grace. Thank you, Doug, for singing that song today. And today, if you have not experienced the forgiveness of the one who took your place on Calvary, I need to tell you that your guilt is undeniable. There is no reason for you to argue that fact. There is no reason to, for you to even come up with an excuse. You have no grounds on which to dispute your accusations. You are guilty. You are a sinner. And because you have sinned, you deserve the stiffest penalty of the law. Your sin deserves to be punished to the fullest extent. But I'm so glad to be able to tell you today that there is one who has grace enough for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. There is one who offers forgiveness. It doesn't matter what's in your past or even in your present, but there is one who offers you a fresh beginning. It doesn't matter what you deserve. There is one who offers mercy. The wages of sin is death. But that's not the end of that verse, Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, Jesus has already paid the penalty for your sin. You don't have to face condemnation because he's already faced it for you. You don't have to get uh, what you have coming to you because you have already gotten it. He's already gotten it on your behalf. You don't have to worry about justice anymore because he suffered to the full extent of the unmerciful law for you. And this morning, you can experience the pardon and the forgiveness of a loving God. He is not willing that you should perish. He wants you to come to repentance. He wants you to say the word that he said to this woman caught in the very act of adultery. He wants to say to you, neither do I condemn you. 
go and sin no more. If you are listening to me today, why don't you come and accept this free gift that God is offering to you? He wants to forgive you. He wants to pardon you. He wants to offer you a clean state, a slate. All you have to do is admit that you are guilty. He knows it already. You know it. Why can't you just admit it to him? Just admit that you are guilty and that you are in need of his grace and forgiveness. And I promise you, it doesn't matter what you've done and where you've come from. His hand of grace will reach out to you. Is there anyone listening to me right now that will say, Lord, I'm guilty. I'm in need of your grace. If you're listening to me today and you're not a Christian, I want to give you the plan of salvation. How do I become a Christian? You must first hear the gospel. I've given you a snippet from the word of God here in John chapter eight, verses one through 11, that has prayerfully pricked your heart and your mind today to make you want to ask the question, what must I do to be? you must hear the gospel. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, Hebrews 11 and six, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that Jesus is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you are an honest seeker of truth, God will provide you with honest teaching. You must repent of your sins, what is repentance, preacher? Rep repentance is a change of mind that says no to sin and yes to God, no to my ways and yes to the ways of God. Acts 17 and 30 says, at the time of this ignorance, God weak that, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. It's a change. You must confess Christ, friend. Jesus says, and Matthew 10, 32, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father God. We'll baptize you for the remission of sins. Baptism uh, is uh, a reenacting of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. What happens when I obey the gospel? I'll tell you. You die to your old way of living when you are immersed or buried in the water that is your spiritual death, where God is washing away all of your sins, when you are resurrected or you come up out of the water, that is your new life. Where Jesus says, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. First Peter 3.21 says, the like figure wherein the baptism doth also now save us. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but it's an answer of a good conscience toward God. That's how you become a Christian. Please contact us. If you want to become a Christian on today, we will make sure that we safely get that done for you today. If you stand in the need of prayer, please put that in one of our, one of our chat lines today. We want to connect with you. We want to send up a prayer on your behalf to God. James 5.16 says, the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avail. Listen, friends and brothers and sisters, shit, prayer not only changes things, it changes people, it changes situations. If we pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 350, uh, five, 365 days a year, it still wouldn't be enough. We can always take time out of our busy schedule to say a prayer to God. Listen, our life ought to be a prayer given to God. We wanna connect with you today. If you stand in the need of prayer, please let us know. If you need to become a Christian, please let us know that as well. I pray that this lesson has inspired you today about the mercy and grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus.
while people around us may uh, uh, be hard on us and they might not ever let us live down mistakes and sins that we have made in our life. There is only one that will forgive you, that will pardon you. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus. May God bless you. May he continue to keep you in the hollow of his arms. As I now turn the service back over to the hands of the brethren, be blessed.